In Michael Hensel's recent book, The Space Reader, he provides a highly pertinent and contemporary understanding of space. It espouses a definition of space that is heterogeneous, an object or system consisting of a diverse range of different items. An example of heterogeneous, for instance, is Manhattan, where complex and multiple social technological conditions are overlaid. This is to be contrasted with highly centralized and ordered modernist cities. With the onset of globalization and the web, heterogeneous space, with its emphasis on differentiation, is more relevant to the contemporary condition, which encourages the mixing of space than a much more st static conception of modernist space. Our new paradigm becomes focused on the experience and perception of the individual, and the individual's perception of space becomes the heterogeneous. So that brings us to our first question. How, as architects, does our role affect, control, or deliver a response of expressions into this new heterogeneous architectural space? To take on. Uh, <clears throat> can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I, I was really interested in this. Uh, I, I am actually going to ask you a question. I was really interested in this topic because. Uh, I think actually uh, the, pro the, the project of space is one that has taken an interesting turn. Uh, my, my, and and uh, I'm motivated to some extent um, by the fact that, my, uh, that uh, our house is a, is a gaming house. <laughs> I don't mean gambling. I, I mean actually, actually uh, the way in which we, uh, my, uh, my kids, work on, uh, on games. Uh, fascinates me. Now, make, I just uh, like to make a, kind of three sort of um, comparisons. How many of you know Halo? All right. I, use, I know some of you don't admit. I don't want to admit to it. Right now. Um, now, what's interesting about Halo is uh, Halo has a theater option, right? So when you go through the campaign, or even I think even in not on multiplayer, but if you're if you're, you're playing on Xbox. If, um, when you go through the campaign, you can actually have it sort of film what you do. Well, what's interesting about that is it doesn't film it in two dimensions. It films it in three dimensions. And by that I mean it actually stores the full space. I'm kind of going back to space. It actually stores the full space in the model. So now why is that weird? Because when you go back to try to look at what you're doing, uh, you catch the full model of you at any, at any moment as you go forward. So, um, so for example, let's say uh, I'm shooting uh, an alien, right? This, uh, there are lots of aliens. Shooting him with grace and love and tenderness? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, Perfect. In, in the form of a, uh, 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 the end of a, a brass uh, cartridge. <laughs> um, so for so example, so you could shoot the, uh, the alien. And uh, if you hit it at the right moment, when you go back with your model, when you hit it at the right moment, you can go back and actually go around yourself and around the alien, and you can go around the, the gun, and you can look at the, and you get right down to the end of the cartridge, because the cartridge is ejected, right? And you can catch it midair, and you look at the end of the cartridge, and you can read the writing on the, on the rim of the cartridge. Now, there's several things that I call that a kind of a hyper hyperspace, because it's not how we think of how we move through space. There we go. I saw this great. Oh, this is like being at home. Anyway, it's not how it's it's not how we move through space. Actually, it, it's it's how it's it's not how we perceive moving through space, because we perceive moving through space like a movie because that's kind of, kind of our vantage point. We don't carry with us the full model of the space, and we don't carry with us that full model of our space in our head as we remember it. Now my point for mentioning that is, okay, so how can we as architects affect space? Well, one thing is for us to try to understand the way in which these new ways of working in the world might affect the way we actually do architecture. To me, it's, it's a fairly profound, um, if we think about tools, and remember, 
Uh, wh why I'm easily amused by these kinds of tools is because I, I grew up with a T-square. <laughs> I know most of you don't know what that is, but it's, oh, it looks like this, and you push it, and, and it's, anyway. Um, so I'm interested in how this way of looking at the world might affect the way we actually produce architecture. More importantly, how this tool might affect the way we produce faith, space, uh, getting back to Lefebvre's definition of or notion of, of, of spatial production, or spatial, as he calls it, spatial practice. So I, I have an answer that's actually just a question. Oh, that was a question. Yeah, it's, a, yeah. <laughs> it's a question of how, how will these things, which we all take for granted, but don't think of them as architecture. But the reality of it is, look, you all and everybody kind of under you to the age of whatever, 10, um, are dealing in a world every day that actually alters the way you think. And it increases the kinds of tools you have for spatial practice. So that's got to change. Uh, that, that has to make a change. Because as you move up through practice, you will change the way we do practice. Because I've, I've watched it. I've watched subsequent generations change how we do practice. You will make that change. Now, I'm kind of interested in how that will be. I think it raises interesting questions, which I'd like to get at later when you all ask other questions. So. Okay. That's it. Okay. Andrew, could you jump? I, if, to me, it's an interesting question about um, and focusing on role, like what our role is. And uh, I would take a slightly different tack, perhaps, and, and focus less on the tools and focus more on the vocabulary. I think space has a vocabulary. and in most schools of architecture across the country and in the world, um, that's not underscored enough. Uh, it's really easy to get seduced by the latest groovy gadget, the latest groovy idea, the latest groovy um, phenomena, and, and build a school around that. And I don't think it has served the discipline of architecture well. And so actually, I, th I think bringing up space today is, is hugely important, but I, but I think the conversation needs to go deeper into the, to what is the vocabulary of space. We can break it down and we can start to learn its pieces and then we can be smart about how we apply the tools, right? I, I, for me, it's not an issue of, of the newest tools or the oldest tools, but I, I do think the architecture is a really old, uh, deep, fundamental discipline. It goes way back, it's prime, I would argue it's primal. And if we forget that primal vocabulary, we're gonna lose sight of, of, it, of its real promise and be um, infatuated with, with other things that we can do. And it's not to say those other things aren't groovy, it's just, it just may not be architecture. I agree with the, um, the dexterity there using the simultaneous view or moving around, you know, it's kind of the dexterity that a new generation Shinhei has. Magnus, though, uh, he threw genius space. I want to take it a little bit further because space is kind of something of the 20th century started falling down uh, all the way from, you know, getting to the moon and you know, then moving around. I see kind of the change that has happened by looking at these beautiful blue planets um, and realizing that's where life happens. That's God, that's the ecosphere, that's the biosphere, that's ecological literacy. Um, also going to the infinite small, and, um, you know, there's space that we know here and it's really hard mathematically conceptual, you can conceptualize it and it evolves. Uh, but it also goes to the infinite small, and an atom has as much space as it, probably more space than matter. And if you were to take the Empire State Building, you know, it would be a little grain if you were to condense the matter. What I'm getting at is that when you start seeing uh, Mang Magnus and Stuttgart, kind of these uh, different ways, it's not just space that we move around in, but it's also the space contained in matter, and how we form new shells, uh, this is a very, um, you know, 
the, the materiality and fabrication technique. And all of a sudden, we had this big loop between space as being that in which we grew, and then the corporate reality mass that we also shape as architects. And that has kind of continued, I think. And, uh, and you know, in, in order to integrate it with, I think, the 21st century brain design, sustainability, um, the, and, and all the different uh, approaches that are current, uh, right? Because heterogeneous space is also about the envelope that we create, which we always consider to be, well, that's the matter, and that's all. It becomes more about space in that matter, porosity, and you know, these type of things, which I think is pretty interesting. It's a future direction, right? We talk about it, the future that is going to be. We're starting to emerge. Uh, I, I, I was inferring from what Hendrik was talking about. I was kind of interested in um, what, I, what I was inferring from what she's talking about was, is a, a, a kind of a, con, a the, the sort of the continuity or flow of space. And I, I, I find that really an interesting question. Uh, Lefebvre talks about the way in which space was situated. And, and when Lefebvre wrote, it was really in the, back, back in the 70s. Um, I think I had a, a 71, actually. Um, uh, so it, that's 40 years ago, just to put it in context. But he, he talked about the nature of a, a dominating space and an a, a appropriating space, and that the, the two are actually quite different. And we've got a graphic example of that right now in this country. Dominating space is a space which is dominated by political interests. Or, or, and essentially what we're most used to are economic interests like um, like the the uh, the mall is, a, is really not a political interest it's an economic interest but they dominate our activity in that space and then appropriation space is of course is real public space and he talks about the the the, uh, the cycle the evolution of space which is as space evolves through time it is it is it's abandoned and then it's reappropriated. And the important thing in the, the latter part of the 20th century was the, and especially um, post Lefebvre, was the reappropriation uh, of urban space. Now, what I, what I find interesting about that is, is and I don't know what Hendrika was saying, is that our, as architects, uh, our role to some extent uh, is uh, conflicted. Because we are, we are actually the um, the, uh, the handmaiden of the power interests, whether we like it or not. It's the power. It's the dominating um, uh, uh, part of our culture that actually employs us. However, we have a conscience, right? And hopefully, we apply that conscience. Um, now, if if, if you want to. A good, what's a good example of appropriating space right now in the, in the United States? It's happening right now in a, very, a way that most of you probably think, this is weird. But somebody who is, came from the 60s doesn't find it weird at all. I grew up with this. It's long overdue. It's, yeah. it, it's, the, um, you know, it's the Occupy Wall Street movement. You know? that's, that's the appropriation of space. Now, how, how does architecture fit into that? You can see the problem that we face, and talk about the role of architecture, is are we then just an instrument of power? Um, how can we engage um, the way in which we can, re the people who are trying to reappropriate that space? Another question, I'm sorry. Can I, I just I, 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 it's an age old uh, position that that architects because we're a service uh, profession are the, I mean handmade is a groovy it's, it's a good uh, moniker actually I'd like that on my business card um, but I, I, don't, I don't I don't think it um, I don't think it, it, it for me it, um, I think that is it's that can be a reality or it can be a myth depending on how we want to structure our relationship to the world, how we want to structure our practice. And the assumption that uh, our clients uh, and the general public and other architects are, are going to completely and, and um, innately understand what the vocabulary of architecture needs to be is, is part of the fallacy. fallacy. Um, 
and I think it's, our, it's incumbent upon us as professionals to, uh, to bring people along with that vocabulary, with that conversation about this is what the relationship can be and should be. And, and once we take that step, it gives us the opportunity to rewrite that relationship and not just have it be, you tell me how to, you know, to jump and I jump. And there's definitely models of people that practice that way. And I'm not being critical of that. It's just, I, I don't think that as the only model of practice is productive and not for individuals, but for the discipline as a whole. I think we've sold ourselves down the river with that larger paradigm, and it's a big one. It's, it's um, since World War II, it's been the predominant one that we just build cities for business um, rather than build cities for people. And the call for um, the rest, paying attention to the rest of the world is a call for reprioritizing things. And I, I think we, can't, we can do that in a very concrete way with the vocabulary of architecture if we control and not controlled by in economic terms, but if we lead the conversation, which means helping people figure out what the words are, how the words go together, and how, how, do, you put it, how do you make a sentence in architectural terms. I mean, it's a, it's a concrete vocabulary. This, um, are you familiar with you know, the uh, jet d'eau, that's the water jet in Geneva? And this is a, it's, it's hard, to, from here it's hard to see the context of this, but, um, these uh, lakes in Switzerland are really quite uh, beautiful. Um, and they're the mountains. Um, and they have a particular scale to them, right? And that scale is, a, um, um, is one that allows for this kind of intervention from a spatially poetic, I mean, thinking about space. This is, it's spatially poetic. If we put this on the middle of Lake Michigan, probably wouldn't have the same impact. But it's, it's, uh, you know, I, it's, it's really a, a powerful statement. But one way that architects can um, exceed that, that power or interest uh, it is in, in, it to engage the poetry of architecture. Um, I, I believe that art comes before everything else. Uh, by, th by that, I don't mean you just make a work of art because it's what you want to do. What I mean is that art, as a, a language, predates every other language that you can think of. Art as a language predates science, predates philosophy, which was the first science, predates architecture, um, predates just about everything that one can think, predates religion. Um, so it's essentially, um, it is a part of uh, the way in which we can operate that I think is a way of taking control of the conversation. Um, and, and to me, that, that is a form of resistance a, a, as opposed to an eidetic statement. Eidetic uh, is the, the Greek word uh, uh, that, that basically says a physical representation of an abstract idea. I'm making this building look like a duck um, so that it will remind everybody to not eat, uh, to not eat meat. Uh, you know, I'm making it up. But I mean, the eidetic statements tend to be fairly, um, fairly short-lived for that reason. Um, but um, using the discipline of architecture to take command of the, the discussion, which is what Chris, Chris is saying, I think at one level, I think is, is, an, is actually a way to, um, to maybe re reverse the, not the right word, reverse the power interest, but that's probably not right. Yeah, well, I don't think it has to come from resistance. It, I mean, for me, it has to come from just building a better damn city. I mean, I mean let's, yeah. I, let's go outside and look at all of the crap. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. So it, this isn't about just resisting money or resisting power. It's we can do a better job. We can actually spend the same amount of money, make the same people. Like, we can do all the things we're doing economically, but just have it have more architectural vitality. But that's not happening because we haven't inserted ourselves into the conversation with any authority. And we've, we've, we give away that authority when we subsume to, well, that's just, you know, the code is what it is, or, or the, the rich guy wants purple. I, I don't know. But so then the, the question, is, I remember a long time ago, Karma Pinoch, who used to practice with Enrique Morales, told this great story about uh, they had a, a client from Germany, wanted a house in the Mediterranean and in Spain, uh, and they had all these pictures of these god-awful traditional Clay tile, well, not got awful, beautiful, classic uh, clay tile, white stucco buildings. And Karma's first reaction is, 
that's not the kind of work I do. Uh, and she wanted to scream her out of the room, but she didn't do that. She just said, okay, okay, and put the folders in a, uh, the pictures in a folder, and then continued to ask them about the relationship of, of the kitchen to the garden, the relationship of the bedroom to the living room, the, the identity and structure of how the house would be constructed. And by working through and giving them the vocabulary for thinking about how their house would be in the world, uh, they got to a place of, in the end, of what the thing was going to look like. And at that point, it never was about styling or just uh, 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 squeegeeing on some icing. Uh, the, the clients were invested in the in integral character of, of what the house was because she had taken them on that journey. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a process of discovery. And I think unless you bring people al along with that, we're, we're, we're tying our hands behind our back. Why are you showing us the Blair Building? I thought you were interested in heterogeneity. It's a cool project, but... That, that's what I was getting at. When you, when you look at this heterogeneous space, you, you see this higher space, and I agree with the uh, higher sphere, the atmosphere of Zutor, which is kind of the material of reality being more narrow uh, versus the external space. Um, and I think it's like this balance between the type of equation that's one versus the other. Um, which is one conceptual space, and it's the objects that we make or poetically and dance. You know, that I agree that uh, poetically we are always pushing the limit to provide imagery for physicists and mathematicians. I think physics of Schlein, you know, is the whole history of how artists sometimes have long preconfigured and idealized uh, what, what physics later on found. So we create these images and going back to the four dimensional, you know. Uh, the dexterity in visual spatial dexterity, you know, kind of are, um, you know, leading the way to the uh, physical health. I have another question, though. I'm European, and we are in what I would say public social space, right? Um, and for a long time, I have tried to see how here in Lubbock, Texas, I'm sorry I'm calling these spaces plays, which is one of the definitions. Uh, where are you? Love Texas there is actually, you know, a type of place where you can go, where you can interact, where um, you know, to bring architecture into the more social realm, you know, more like New York or LA. Where does this happen in, in Love of Texas? Where where do people go to meet? And it's probably different for different generations. We go in our houses and play Halo, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think a very successful one it is maybe Market Street and uh, the concept of Market Street where when you walk in the morning you know you create this um, you know I want to be pragmatic, you know, where people go and you just meet people and you know it's the cafe that you have in every corner in Europe, right? Where people go and socialize. Um, it, are there other realms though, maybe imaginary on the social spaces that are created in other Texas. But, uh, like, how would we go about, again, maybe it's economically very well taught out about who markets for the leaders, you know, designers, developers. But, um, you know, it, it's easy to talk about Lake Geneva. It's more difficult, I think, to translate it into the American West and love Texas. And, Tech Terrace is not what it used to be, a social space, I think. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to kind of find out what do you think, what are social spaces that are successful uh, on a day-to-day -day basis that you use um, as students. Uh, that was my question. You know, That's a good question. Somebody has an answer. I, um, when uh, Kay was working uh, with the, the or early, the first uh, one of postmodernism, and we were talking about the, the sort of uh, bankrupt interior of that um, uh, outfitting store. I mean, and it was seeing it as kind of a negative. Um, but I was impressed because you came up with uh, the typical Walmart, and to see the two, and here we are, we're going, oh well, you know, it's, this is not very, this is not very uh, cool. It, I mean, it's sort of postmodernism, scenographic. Uh, Postmodernism is worse, very scenographic and I mean, But on the other hand, it was an environment that was so much better than the Walmart one. I thought it was a brilliant juxtaposition. And we kind of got off on another topic, unfortunately. 
Because, so I, I think um, Hendrick has got an interesting point here, and I, I think it, it also fits with my concern about the way in which our, uh, our, our digital world works. I want to just make two observations. Paul Virilio writes, after the fields and the forests, the cities and the suburbs will be evacuated of work and social intercourse. After the space of the countryside, urban space will be destroyed, one after the other. And his interest there, his concern there, is the rise of a digital culture. Now, um, this is in a, a landscape of events, which was written in the 90s. Um, that's, that's before the culture got hyper-digital. So I was thinking about, you know, Foucault says, if you want to un try to understand our, our, our culture, you have to understand our neuroses. And um, getting over my own, let me just sort of make a kind of an observation. There, there's um, a canonical, a, a, a kind of a, a, a loss uh, of, um, of resemblance is, um, is uh, canonical neuroses, hysteria. That, that by that I mean that's back at the time when people were surprised by things and they'd faint. That's, that's, you know, so that comes up to the, it comes up to World War II. Uh, maybe it starts with World War I. The, the, um, the, the rise of the machine culture, um, the horror of World War I, the rise of expressionism in art, and then, and then the rise of paranoia in the world. Um, and, and paranoia is this kind of this, the second great uh, neurosis. And of course, then we get to the, the um, and, and you all know what paranoia is. Michael, Michael Peters has this wonderful thing. He says, just because you're paranoid, paranoid doesn't mean people aren't out to get you. Now, what, what I like about, um, the third one, of course, is schizophrenia, and, that's, and that you could probably already tell, that's my generation. Um, the children of the 60s, um, we, we saw the world in a somewhat fragmented way, um, and so we, uh, we, we sort of see that in a schizophrenic way. Now you could say, well, the digital world is, what is the digital world? Well, the schizophrenia w was something that uh, was handled with certain kinds of drugs, but the drug of choice today is anxiety. It's, a, it's an anti-anxiety drug, not an, an, not a depre not an anti-depression drug, but anti-anxiety. And just about, you know, about 95% of the population is on it. And you, you don't know it, but we're all on it in one way or another. Could be TV, uh, could be um, professional sports. That's why the water um, tastes so good. That, that's why the, well, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm reading a book now that's totally convinced that fluoride is, is a, it is exactly that. It's a big drug. To, because we actually, there, are, there is some proof that if we take too much fluoride, we, we lose our cognitive abilities and we, we, and we, come, we become placid. But, um, but what is it, and I realize what it is, is um, in the digital age, it's, the, it's, the, it's a displacement anxiety. Because we deal with uh, multiple realities at the same time. Um, and that's hyperplay. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it does have some implications for how how we deal with architecture. Um, it 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 does in, in the sense that um, it is something to be concerned with when you have hyper reality. Then how do you if architecture is really about being real? And, and what I kind of refer to here is. Um, is spatial practice and the emergence of the real after a book by Hal Foster. But it's, it's who's an art critic. But, but essentially, it's how do we then recenter ourselves in a physical world when so much of our life is digital? What is, what is architecture's role there, a uh, role then to concretize, using words that Norbert Schulz used in Intentions in Architecture, to concretize our environment? How do we concretize our environment? That's another question. I have an, a question here. This is for Professor Bulings. Um, we're talking about social spaces in um, Tech Terrace. And I've lived there for 25 years now, and I've seen the change in the space over the years. And recently, I recognized that one of the most social spaces is happening in the middle of Tech Terrace Park with a dog club that meets every day at sunset and people interact, they talk to each other. Now where can you go and talk to total strangers with that sort of comfort, except where you have a dog, and the dog is a reason for communicating with others? 
And I, uh, it's kind of a, a shift of you don't go to coffee shops because you can't talk to people there. You, don't, you go, well, if you drink, you go to bars. But you know, if you're a sober person, you should get a dog. <laughs> Because it is exactly true. And I do go there, even without a dog. <laughs> <laughs> it's my way to get my son a dog without having to uh, invest a dog and uh, hold him and feed him and sitting here for three months when you're gone or something like that. Mm -hmm. But that is a wonderful, uh, spontaneous, it's just like the change to see it just happen. It it's beautiful. If you don't know, you really have to just pass by there and you see spontaneously how people are creating. And that, I think, we have to support as architects. I, mean, I think it's part of the role to recognize these things and to be, you know, this is a beautiful event. Thank you for that example. I think I forgot about one. You know, and I think there are many others that you can become mindful of. I mean, it's the mindfulness of the recognizing this beautiful for a different generation, because these houses, the terrace was built for, you know, in the 1940s, and they, you know, all the generation were young, and they came back from the war, and they had small families, and everybody lived there, and pretty much the houses are still from there. But these people have left, and we are here, but a very heterogeneous type of students and people moving, but that is a wonderful example. Thank you. Um, and, you know, the grass is age, too. There's no age limit to that grouping. Of the and there's no uh, exclusion of dogs neither. <laughs> 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 what a beautiful collection of animals. Don't bring your cat. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I, I, it's a different way of changing, right? I mean, change it can mean hyperspace and imaginary spaces, as we're talking virtual space, and how we can, you know, and they, these are kind of natural things happening. Yeah, which is and I'm sure there are other examples. And there's the bike tour. The bike. Uh, all of a sudden, you hear all this noise, and, and they're all out in front of my house, and they're all. <laughs> We're fleas blocking the streets. I, I think it's cool. I mean, I, 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 but but it, but that is it, it's having a space that that people feel that they can uh, they can go into and they can do things there. Um, uh, as uh, as a society, and and that's what it is the tragedy of what's going on um, in terms of the the breaking up of the Occupy Wall Street. Um, that I don't want to get into a political conversation, but but the the, the that is public space. Um, we one of the things that is that the the part of of. Um, on under, understanding the, uh, our rights as, as human beings and individuals is the ability to occupy uh, public space and getting back to the role that we have as architects, it's important for us to design that public space. Now, it, and, and, and I don't think I don't think contemporary architecture is good at it, to be honest with you. No. Um, and it, it's uh, I, I, I'll give you an example: the Caltron Caltran building, not, um, Tom Maine's Caltran building. I was just there with Maria. Maria and I were just there the other, um, this last week or the week before, a week, a week ago, I think. And um, that space in front of it um, is, uh, is it at least sort of nicely defined, but it doesn't really accommodate. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting building, uh, but it doesn't really accommodate the public. It's, it's not appropriated, it's not appropriable. That's, that's not a word. We, you can't reappropriate it, and I, and I think that's a uh, that's a travesty, um, a tragedy, not a travesty. It's a tragedy that we're not def we're not we're not designing um, public spaces anymore, and part of that I think is uh, is how both art and architecture have become flat over over the, the second half of the 20th century. Um, oddly enough, at the same time. We uh, we were trying to um, uh, to bring back Milo Cite and and some of the Hegman and Pete and some of the great kind of, uh, treatises on on defining urban space um, and that went through the the seventies but then it's the, as we started reinventing it's cool uh, as I started reinventing um, 
um, architecture theory, we started um, uh, collapsing architectural space. I think we need to regain that, that, uh, that ability. And this is where I come back to, to vocabulary. And, and as much as I'm a fan of Lefebvre, it's uh, and all that's come, all that architecture has learned from drawing from all that theory is unless we translate it from the language of philosophy into a language of architecture, into, into a language that I can build with my hammer, nails, um, whatever the tools I, but I make it concrete. Uh, and, and spatialize them. And this is where I think your topic is important. If we can't spatialize it and occupy it, then it's it's just another distraction. It may be an intellectual distraction rather than a, a, a Guga distraction. But it, I, I think it's it's problematic. And I, I like the the event uh, thinking about event space uh, like the dog park or or the the bike ride is interesting to me. But the, the fundamental question still remains is, is what do we do with it as architects? Uh, we can become event planners, we can, we can make uh, rallies, we can make great parties, that's all fantastic, I'm a big fan of all of that. Uh, but ultimately, uh, th what do we bring to that that, that uh, the cruise ship uh, director or the chef or um, the accountant brings, right? We actually have tools unique to our ability as architects, and we need to translate those forces into into something that we can build from. And I think if we don't, then we're we're entering into some nice um, parlor conversation, but we're not actually um, spatializing it. We're not turning it into our something we can make architecture of. Well, one of the problems we did is we're not very good with philosophy. Um, and when architects took over Lefebvre, they missed all the right chapters. They 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 read part of the book and forgot to read the part that dealt with architecture. I'm not exactly sure why. You get the email. But Lefebvre talks about um, planes and axes, which which from my point of view is a, is a, a geometric understanding of space. He talks about surface and depth, which is of course a haptic understanding of space. He talks about language and connotation, which is associational. He talks about consciousness, which is imageability. When we talk about imageability. We're talking about gestalts. You're talking, uh, you're talking about um, the way in which gestalts become, and, 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 and certainly the, the image of the city, Kevin Lynch's image of the city, those, those five types, archetypes, are just five gestalt. He, he just took gestalt theory and he put them into the pieces that meet, meet the city. But, but that's, that's how things become imageable in our world, which is distinct from association. And, and he also talked about uh, time and space, and Lefebvre also talked about, the, I think another knotty issue that we have today is, uh, is the issue of time and space. And I uh, hope maybe we get a chance to talk about that. But what's interesting, what the, because they, the task that you gave us, Mark Lefebvre, and I kind of, I went back to my Lefebvre and read it. I, I, made, I did the same thing. I concentrated on the, the, the ideas of representation, the, 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 the kind of the juxtaposition of representational space, and then and then in the space that uh, that is um, inflected by how we think um, versus and the sort of the, the three pieces of the production of space. Um, but I missed the part in the middle. Um, Lefebvre actually talks about things which I think are really intentional biases that we carry as designers. But it's not the sexy part, so we 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 miss that. But I, I but, but that's not to say I'm, I'm not disagreeing with Chris. Actually, I I, I agree with him. I think that um, it's in these other ways that we can create better space. Uh, in in these this other piece of Lefebvre that we don't ever talk about as architect, understanding that the world has a geometry, and that geometry has to do with perception. Understanding that the world is essentially haptic. It's haptic before it's lingual. And we are haptic individuals. Uh, you all are, otherwise you would have, you would have gone into English or something like that. Um, and it, and it, it's also associational. And we deal with the associations that come with the architectural environment. We, we read them better than anybody else because we understand their form. And it's also, it also has to do with this idea of imageability because that's how we perceive the world. It gets down to the gestalts of of edge um, um, and domain and landmark. The, these are all, and, and, and um, uh, uh, connections or loci, these are all basic idea, uh, uh, form-making ideas. And you can control those as a designer. And 
the other thing about them is they don't cost any money. But we can't. But to, to control them in, only in the domain of imageability and controlling them as images is again to. I mean, ultimately, we need to control them spatially. We need right, to control right. them in a way that's experienced. Right. So, do you? Rats. Um, there's a fantastic. Taking possession of place, space is one of the first actions of humans. I'm not pointing to these events as merely events, but if you create plazas and take yeah. them off. So tilted arc? Did you find tilted arc? More sensible tilted arc? Between these events, where you find that image? Let's just do a search. And then emulate that. Mm -hmm. Then you find your image. I think that is one of our tasks to really be that sensitive to what people are doing in their design for them rather than superposing almost, you know, like modernist in the 50s have gone, kind of superimposing this is going to be a successful social space because you cannot design this way, which is really most of what these questions are about. Now, the, the techniques and tools, the cognitive, also the analysis, um, the cognitive mapping, how does one experience, sociologists have looked at that, and Kevin Lynch being one of them, you know, how do you, um, because, well, maybe you can put a piece of art in a big plaza, that doesn't mean, mean necessarily it's a successful social place. Place, you know, there's nobody around. Right? As architects will always make photographs of sculptures and architectural buildings without human beings around. Right? Get out of my picture. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that is so ingrained in our teaching that maybe, you know, that's why I wanted to go back to the events, because if it's not for us human beings, you know, or um, then we're missing. You know, we can design as much as we want, but we miss them to serve. You know, the people are making them happy. Uh, as a definition of most That's the URL. So you mentioned it's the first uh, very early human act is to take possession of space. This is a work by the artist Richard Serra. Um, it was commissioned as a public artwork it's called Tilted Art. Uh, it was commissioned as a permanent uh, art in public places project. Uh, but it didn't last very long uh, because people got pissed off. Uh, it was a modernist square uh, plaza in New York City, and the big move was to create this simple, tilted, curved, uh, cortend wall of steel that, that drew a diagonal, made a diagonal across the space. And so what he did was take this space that was fairly flexible and inhabitable in many ways and force you to negotiate with him. He inserted something that forced a negotiation, right? So if I wanted to go diagonally across the space the other way, I was thwarted. Uh, so it, in this way, to me, it, I mean, it's a, a didactic example of, of how we, we can uh, polarize or, or, or the, the effect of, the, of, of sp spaces have effect. They have tangible effects that we, can, that we can measure. And we can measure them in political ways. We can measure them in a, in a great number of ways. But, but ultimately, we can measure them in spatial terms, right? We can talk about their spatial implications. Um, oh yeah. Um, on on the same sort of term as the Sarah piece, uh, I was just in Chicago uh, a couple weeks ago, and there was an artist that did this exhibit of um, Marilyn Monroe. Uh, it's in this plaza in Chicago. You should probably pull it up. Pretty provocative kind of image. But this is groovy. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm getting distracted. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is another kind of space. I actually have two, two parts to say. And this, the first part is what kind of Chris is getting at um, about sort of the a, a, a creation of space by some sort of object in that place creates an event, right? We saw two other events like the Tech Terrace thing and the um, Occupy Wall Street. Those are sort of created in a different way. They're, they're quite different spatially. But like the Sarah piece and the Marilyn Monroe piece that I'm referring to is much different. And as an architect, I think we are in some ways, not as an urbanist, but as an architect, uh, we're much more inclined to sort of think about space as a, sort of a thing happens, and ob an object in space occurs, and that creates a sort of an effect. An effect by perception, conception, or experience. And what's interesting, yeah, there she is. Uh, She's gorgeous, right? Um, 
And what's interesting, the same sort of topic, like uh, Professor Brelinks was saying about get out of my picture. I need, the, I need, I want just me and Marilyn Monroe's leg, you know? <laughs> like, I, you know, it's just. You didn't do that, did you? Oh, of course. <laughs> um, no, I was actually too intimidated by her. Um, but it's interesting because without that piece, the space is so much different, right? And the event of people sort of walking by, everybody wants to grab her leg and look up her skirt. <laughs> Every single person. So that creates an event, but then it also uh, defines sort of an experience in that event. And so um, part of this question, I guess, is back to the original one, um, or maybe it's more of a comment than a question, but so there is a role there. Something is created and then these sort of events occur as an effect, right? So how, as architects, or what sort of mechanisms, and this is a really tough kind of question, like what mechanisms, what, what mechanisms create these sort of effects? Um, in this way, much more direct, right? Uh, this is pretty architectural and as, as a spatial kind of sequence. Um, Everybody's looking for a space? Right. <laughs> yeah, it's something like that. Um, and then, just while I have the mic, I'm gonna hog some more. Um, the sec, yeah, look at that. I found it. <laughs> Perfect, Kate. I, I didn't want to know. That's why he's I the I wanted Googler. to let the mystery be. Yeah. <laughs> I asked for the lift, you know. Um, so that's, that's one part. And, and then my second part that's totally uh, quite, quite different is the discussion of sort of the contemporary architecture not creating sort of positive space or some kind of things like this. And one thing I'm sort of realizing or, or that I'm seeing is people like, um, Cecil Balmont and um, Roland Snooks and all these sort of really intense um, computational algorithm uh, sort of algorithmic constructs are much more about sort of the object. They're object savvy, not spatial savvy. Absolutely. And so the output of the spaces that are uh, that come about because of these sort of intense algorithmic uh, intensities or algorithmic kind of conceptions um, aren't about space at all. Right. And there's outputs, there's these sort of intense inputs that are put in, the outputs come about and it might, well that's, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but it, that's, that's I think uh, everybody at the, on the panel was sort of getting to that. Um, yeah. And I just wanted to make it clear in that kind of sense that, you know, is it now about the sexy curve or is it about what the sexy curve does spatially? Right. right. And I think that's, I mean, to me, the, the thing about the fashionable di diversions is well-intentioned. We're learning a lot from that process, but I don't think we're using those tools smartly yet. I don't think we've, I don't think we've internalized them f uh, spatially or architecturally yet. Uh, and it's not to say that, that we shouldn't be involved, in, totally invested in them and exploring them deeply, but uh, until we bring it into, into our vocabulary, uh, it's, it's yet another distraction that takes us to another place, a disciplinary place. And I'm, I'm a big proponent of interdisciplinaryism, of learning things from outside of our frame, but unless we bring it back, we have to go out and we have to come back and we have to translate it back into stuff we can build, spaces we can inhabit, and then critique it on those terms, right? Not just because oh, I've never seen it before, so therefore it's good. I mean, we're looking at Burning Man not just because it's a freak show, but, but it's a different kind of space that is deliberately constructed that allows uh, and other forms of reality to take place. And we can critique it on its freak factor or we can t critique it on its architectural uh, form and space factor. And I, I think as architects, we need to operate in, in, in that arena or it's just this continual downward slide into crap. And, and, and the more I... Uh One of the other problems, I, 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 I totally agree with, um, with this. One of the other challenges is that the simulacra which governs our, our culture, our visual culture, is it, the irony of it is that the more things change, the more they're the same. And that comes back to uh, the point that both Chris and Hendrika made Hendrika from the social side, Chris from the formal side, that it comes down to vocabulary. And my, my sort of concern about us flattening our, our space, because I see it in all the projects that we do, is that um, we're not building the kinds of skills we need 
uh, to create cogent public spaces in the world. And understanding now, we should understand how important those spaces are politically. Even if we don't use them, they are important spaces for us to, to be able to um, support. And as we work in the urban environment, we, in many cases, we're, we just do a building. We're not making a space. But we have the opportunity to add to that space or to um, uh, reinforce that space or to inflect that space, depending upon the nature of the project that we have. And if we don't understand making a public space, um, we, uh, we, we'll, we'll, we, we run the risk of destroying the possibility of creating good public spaces. But I, I think it's important for us to understand the, how the digital world works. But, we need to, but I think it's also important for us to understand that um, this changes how we think. And if it occludes our ability to deal with public space, in a sensitive way, then that's abrogating our role um, as an architect. And that I don't think is a good idea. I have a question for Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> <laughs> what is different her <coughs> being in the middle of this object in the plaza in the Art de Triomphe in Paris, or it, which is Kevin Lane's landmark, right? It's a monument. Uh, for this culture, Marilyn Monroe is a mom. Her dress was sold for $250,000 just a little while ago. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, can we get maybe Rand Kohlhaas all here? I read, and I think it's open for debate that maybe uh, this is Rem Kohlhaas, is one of the public places we visited during a study abroad where Rem Kohlhaas has taken one of the satellite cities around Amsterdam and really um, reprogrammed it into multi-use. You're in front of the town house, the library, uh, the um, People are living above the mall, and it's one of the most public places uh, with uh, its pedestrian. Uh, public transportation is on the ground floor, it's below grade. Uh, and I, I remember that we were with uh, Professor Neiman and all the students and uh, some other uh, French uh, professors that are working on this public. Uh, on these uh, on public places in uh, l'espace urbain uh, in French, but that's part of the specialization. And they were all h h hilarious about this type of multi-use and the successful creation from scratch, because this is a new city. It's not a old one. Um, now, there, there, there seems to be a resistance to multi-use and um, multi-programming a space in this particular sense. And even to me, it was really surprising. And I think it's a very, very advanced, great example of a successful, unpublished, but very successful, really uh, designed public space um, where a lot of social interaction happens uh, because people live there, they work there, they uh, go to uh, shopping, they can all in the same street, literally in the same street. So I wanted to give that example as uh, some contemporary developments by, um, you know, that are actually being built and being used, and it should be completed by now. Uh, uh, the way in, oh, the way OMA works uh, is really quite interesting. Uh, they create uh, what I call a neo technology when they when they sit down to design a city or a space or or a multi-use project like this. They look at other cities, projects, places in the world, and they, um, they diagram them over and over and over again until they, uh, until they create um, a kind of a, um, a language that comes from looking closely at the environment. And it's a very analytical way of working, actually. And even though most of us, when we look at OMA's work, um, like, like looking at the work of Christian de Portsenpar, for example, looks like it's totally idiosyncratic, but it's not. 
It comes from close, closely looking at and analyzing other places in the world and then understanding those places and how they work and then reappropriating them in a way that supports uh, various um, um, social activities. But isn't that what makes it so successful is because you have the space, but then you have the multi-use, which builds a dialogue between space and the vent, and then it begins to progress. So no uh, because the city itself is almost a living, you know, of emergencies and different things like that. So it's constantly developing over time. And with the multi-use, you have the advantage of beginning to develop with the actual community. So all these groups can be, begin to gather because it can fit their purpose and the architecture works for them as well, and not just work for a certain program. Good urban spaces um, house, can house somewhat comfortably one person, a, a small group of people, a large group of people, and even larger group of, uh, of people. So it's, but, but it, it doesn't, it, it, it isn't by abstract, sort of getting, this gets back a little to Jeff's question, um, it isn't by abstract geometries that, those, that good spaces occur. It's by looking closely at the kind of social interaction and how that social interaction works well in one space and then understanding it on an essential level and then being able to reappropriate that into the new space. We have to become students of that, the interaction you're, you're just describing. That's, a, that's another role but, for us. But I think t today, though, more, more than ever, was the, f the foundation, the fundamentals. I mean, I sound like a... I'm from the 16th century, which makes me a little nervous, but I, I totally believe this, that the fundamentals, the core fundamentals of, of what architecture, how we, not what architecture is, but how we go about defining it, um, are more important today than they ever were. And more and more schools are moving farther and farther away from teaching those fundamentals, right? From focusing on the nuts and bolts, because they're not very sexy. I mean, they, they, you know, it's, it's a, it takes time to, to slog through that to get good at it. And, but to not do that, we can then generate a, I mean, you know, the OMA's work is interesting because they are able to realize and, um, things at, at a high level with, with those strong fundamentals. But if we look at, across the board at a, at a, a vaster, you know, vaster cross-sectioning, uh, I mean, you mentioned the word earlier, flattening. Uh, more often than not, we see a, a, a washing out of the spatial substance of, of what's being built today. And, and that's a travesty. I mean, and, and, and I say that not just because I don't like it. I say that because it's a travesty historically. It's a travesty for the history of, of our discipline. I mean, we're writing ourselves out of existence by not paying attention to the, to the core of what we should be doing. And that's, that's a mistake. I'm just, I'm just trying to bring together the conversation that you've been having, and I've been realizing that there's two main topics that have been discussed on this dialogue. Number one is the public space, or the social, social space, I would say. And uh, that brings a lot of uh, comments or questions about uh, international situationism, about the idea of the Society of Spectacle by Good Award. And, uh, and of course, Lefebvre was discussed about it, which is one of the members of the International Situationist Group. I'm the creator of the International uh, Group. Uh, in this realm, um, there's very interesting characters. I mean, that I believe that we shouldn't get aside. Like one of those is Super Studio by Natalini in the 1970s, in which was kind of like this creation of the open space that, that everything would I mean, it's like an open big grid. I don't know if you can pull out Super Studio by Natalini. Yeah. And uh, it's a quite interesting exercise in which it's a quite open space, which is a grid, it's a platform, and uh, the people could pull out everything from underground by just touching the, those kind of like squares on the platform and they could live freely. And there was no need even to wear clothes there because the, the space itself was providing everything they needed. Mm -hmm. And uh, then after that, we have constant and the new Babylon exercise as well, which is another appropriation of space, uh, although he was also situationist. But um, somehow, kind of like uh, this diverting to the whole idea of the social space and how the appropriation of space by people. Oh, those they are, they're gorgeous. The one on there, the one before that one, the one on the left side. Uh, up, above. No, next. that one. Keep going to your left. No, no, left, no. left, left, left. Like another one? That one, that's for studio. Great example, this exercise of the quite open grid space. 
with all these guys living like hippies because they don't even need clothes anymore. And uh, the tents are just a divertiment. They're just like a, to play, a playground because they don't even need a tent. They can live freely on this huge kind of like platform, push on the ground and the food will pop up. And uh, there's uh, heat on their, underneath, there's cooling systems underneath. So the space is providing all kind of comfort that they may need for living. Uh, there was a lot of experiments on this during the 1960s and 1970s on trying to really understand the space. And then the whole idea of event that uh, Good Abort brought out as well and kind of chasing people on the city just to see how they behave. Or the Cytogenist exercise of walking on the roofs of Paris just to understand the space from the roof, not from the street level. Uh, there's plenty of exercises of that. Where are we leaving that now in the schools of architecture? I think it's also very important to try to understand the spaces we're living. And Lubbock is one of those places that we can, we can read in a more intellectual way as well, because uh, I think that churches here are the only uh, places for socializing, I mainly on, on this place, no? not even the coffee shop, and, and we now realize the dog kind of walk. So that's kind of something that I found really interesting on this conversation, space with people. Mm -hmm. And how, how is this interaction? Uh, Burning Man is amazing. Well, the other topic that I've been discussed on this table is um, about uh, hyperspace and cyberspace, which is another very interesting topic. Juhani Palazna says that there's a huge disconnection still between the hyperspace and what a space for people should be. And examples we have from Mar Marcos Novak and uh, his, or Tom Kovac as well in which he kind of deals with these amazing digital spaces. Uh, there's two magazines by the Cyber Architecture 1 and Cyber Architecture 2 from the 1990s, early 1990s, which is the beginning of all this kind of scenario. So uh, they're amazing spaces. But still, where's the people on there? No? And it's turning back to what uh, Jeff was talking about uh, a few minutes ago. So when are we going to make this connection between people and cyber architecture and hyperspace. I think that's, that's kind of like the open question that I will have. Is that gonna happen? I guess that it may, but uh, when and how is, is to be the big question. No? I, I, I actually think your two, your two ideas go together. Um, I, I had in here, uh, I was interested, the question I raised earlier was exactly that question about cyberspace. And Michael Benedict, who wrote the earliest book on cyberspace, makes a pretty interesting point. He, he warns of the erosion of spatial significance. And I'll give an example. Um, back in my day, when you had a phone that had a wire on it, I know it's hard to imagine, a cord, um, is that you'd, you'd call somebody up and say, you know, I'll meet you at the, uh, to borrow a term from Fireside Theater, the old same place. Um, or, in that case, space or place had a meaning because when you set the phone down, you, the next time you could see that person was at the old same place. But now, now, now how is it? Where are you now? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just getting in my car. <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm getting ready to go down to the bottom of me. I'll, I'll, I'll see you out in front. Out in front. First, there's a lot of, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the drop call. Um, shit, will they call that? <laughs> yeah, you, know, you don't need to know a place anymore. You know, you could just, you know, how many times have you, you know, you're talking to somebody and all of a sudden they come around the corner and they're talking, they're talking to you, right? Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, I mean, I, I um, uh, Javier is just right. It's a, it, it, to some extent, it's, a, it's an evaporation of space. And I'm trying to find my, I had a quote here that I got, um, um, uh, again from Aurelio. Like, I'm really prescient, given the fact that when he wrote, and, uh, while the illustrated history book evokes the mental imagery of real or emblematic memories, the television monitor collapses memories, close-ups, and cancels the coherence of our fleeting impressions. I love that phrase. It collapses the coherence of our fleeting impressions. Just like when we were on the phone with the cord, we had to have in our head an idea of where I was going to meet you. But with the, as long as we can just continually talk to each other, you know, I don't need to know anything other than uh, kind of re in rel relatively speaking, where, where are you relative to where I am? 
And what is the coherence of our fleeting impressions? Life. That's another way of talking about life. Because when you think about it, that's how we define our life. It's the, the coherence of our fleeting impressions. So yeah, I, I think that there's a real, a real issue here. But it actually kind of goes back a little to the super studio. And, and the, the other part that I, that I was a little interested in is this, because super to some extent, super studio uh, made a, a basic assumption that space and time could collapse. I mean, look at those people. They're primitive people, or are they super, uh, are they super modern people? You know, well, you don't really know. They look kind of primitive. I mean, hey, even, hey, hey. even from my point of view. <laughs> but um, you know, to me, though, that raised a, a kind of a, a question of, well, are we going towards, and then this gets to, to Jeff's question, about, OK, and I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm bruising his idea here, but I was inferring from what he was saying that it has to do with the nature of these geometries, which seem to be more object-oriented and spatially oriented. In which case, then, um, where does that go? I mean, where does that take us? And to some extent, um, we went through the period of the machine. Right? We went through a period of various opportunities for the building to become a machine. And we've kind of gone away from that now. Um, in, in some ways, we're getting to the building as an organ. Um, the, the building as a, a biological event. And I ran across this quote from Sylvia Lavin having to do with Richard Neutra. And it's, um, architecture for Neutra is a technique and an instrument that engages the processes of individualization and intrasubjective experience. I mean, I'm not exactly sure what that is, but I'll take her out of the report. The articulation of spatial, spatiality plays an important role in this function. For space evokes the terror of being outside the mother, but also recalls the womb as a protective vessel. That's pretty biological. And she goes on to talk about how Neutra was actually interested in this idea of how the building could somehow provide the same sort of both shock and comfort of birth. And if you read a little bit about Neutra, he was kind of a health nut. Um, but I, this idea that um, architecture might have a kind of a, rather than a machine uh, metaphor, might have a biological metaphor, actually is pretty interesting to me. Um, although I'm not sure that those geometries necessarily go in that direction. Um, they might. They, they sort of feel like it when I, when I see them. And one, one last comment on that. Um, Le Corbusier wrote about the house as a machine for living, for which everybody for the next 50 years called them a fascist. But um, in French, the word machine is both a mechanical thing, like we know it, but it's also a series of organs from an animal. So from Le Corbusier's point of view, the relationship, the biological nature of a machine, um, I think that's, that's more his intention than the mechanical nature of the machine. So, uh, I don't know, I think, I, Javier, you've got the, I think you've got the two, I think those two ideas are actually really quite profound ideas, but I don't have an answer to it. I just see that as the platform from which we're working. Let me address hyperspace in your quest for Novak, who actually was a student of mine when I was in UCLA. We worked together. Um, you are all very familiar with Star Wars, probably, and um, physics has developed into quantum physics, and maybe the next, and we, we really go into, you know, maybe where that could lead, and I will come back, I will fall back. Maybe with teleportation, we could inhabit hyperspaces. Only if you watch you know, some of the newest physics, you would say that even if you do that, we don't know if you still exist. You can exist in two places simultaneously, but you might disappear here and show up in Paris, right? But not knowing if you still exist as an embodiment here. 
I mean, I'm serious. I mean, you know, this was a Nova, if you look at it. I mean, that's what the future speculations are. And maybe that's how we can, you know, that is, again, like, that's what I said. I started with, we can look always into the future. On the other hand, I want to fall back and really go, we still are a body that needs air. We are very fragile. We are very fragile animals. And by the way, we're just one out of 14 million species, as the UNESCO has elaborated. We're f you're one out of 14 million species that are living only on planet Earth, most of which we, we don't even know. They not, have not been enumerated. Now, as architects, we still we cannot go as far as not thinking about the well-being of the individual client as well as our role it is, I think, as architect to make sure that we address the role of society at large. So by what we're doing, we not only make our client richer and in experience, uh, but also the society at large. And I think that the profits of modern architects like Le Corbusier, like Frank Le Wright, they didn't just say, we are architects for our clients and we make a big buck or we become stars, by the way. And you know the star ideology of novelty, even for Rem Kohlhaas, he will come to the United States to write his theory. He goes to Europe to actually make it and build it. And I think here, you know, we, you know, as much as I love theory in you know conceptualization, in imagination, in visualization, that is great. But on the other hand, I think the main task is also to really get back with our feet on planet Earth, on which we live, unfortunately, and as long as we Earth-bound, try to make better public places than just the Maryland Monument. I'm sorry, because to me, that's, I want to get away from that, and that's why I pointed to maybe uh, a more successful urban place that uh, our urban cities, or multicultural, multi-layered, now discreteness, like when you go shopping here, you go to the mall. I grew up on a roof terrace in the middle of a city. I could go downstairs, walk across the street, and do and see a movie before I even go to school. I would, you know, there were all these multi-layer and multi, you know, kind of layering of programming. And when we go to tools, in I agree, as architects, yes, Rem Kohlhaas, for example, they would have a book like that on diagramming and studying, observing projecting precedent studies, reading what has been done, reading the public space that one visits, and trying to break it down, diagnose it, so that we can use it to generate new solutions. And I think that, you know, that is what education should do, is trying to help students and be ourselves, because, you know, we live in different times all the time, you know. To, how do we read what we see and how can we appropriate it and actually use it in our generative methods and go, you know, which, which, which goes faster and faster. In the new generation, um, they will change the world. Uh, All of us have to be experts in hyperspace and visualization. So, anyway, the 60s are over. I mean, the capitalism in the 60s are over. The capitalism is over. So, that was a great experience. I think it was a really, uh, in terms of critical thinking, which is what we need desperately. That was a very good experiment to make us understand what's going on. Or how, how can we approach the things from a different direction than the, the typical one? No? So I was watching a program on Discovery Channel, and everything that they do in Star Trek is truth. So I guess in order to get into a cyberspace, we need to wait for a few years until we're able to kind of like dematerialize ourselves or do something like that. But I don't think so. Um, quite several years ago, I saw an exhibition in London uh, by Toyo Ito was named uh, Visions, Visions of the Future, in which the entire room was this TV screen, ground floor, ceiling, walls, and there were images happening around you when you were walking inside of that room. And Visions of Japan was the name of that exhibition by Toyo Ito. 
And then there were these sculptures in the middle of the room which were sensors. The moment that you were reaching them, uh, the sensor kind of like uh, can, could feel the heat of your body and the entire imaginary around you changed entirely. So depending on the heat of your body, everything, the space was created. But that, I would argue that's not architecture. That's good image play, well, maybe a lot of fun, but ultimately it's another distraction though. I mean, maybe yes, I'm just trying to make that connection where it can happen. And uh, maybe it's not going to happen until, I don't know, 2,000 years but, from now. But the connection you're trying to make is one of cyberspace? Yes. Oh, okay. I just but, to... but we, we are making the future this moment by what we do and what we don't do. And so to put it off for, you know, when the magic goo shows up, you know, then all of a sudden we'll have it. You know, well, the Philadelphia experiment happened in, or didn't happen in 1943, um, where a ship went from the Philadelphia Harbor to, the, to Virginia. Uh, and when it came back, some of the people were embedded in the ship and some not, and the story goes. But uh, I, mean, I, I, mean, I think we can, we, I, mean, I think your call for where is the futurism today is spot on, and, and that, is a, is a, that we need to ring that bell loud and clear. But I, I, I mean, I, I come back to this question of, of, of are we dealing with it in spatial terms or are we just getting distracted with, you know, is it, is it just um, nice amusement park design with TV screens? I mean, you know, the, uh, there's an aspect of exhibition design that's very productive spatially and there's an aspect of it that is very, it's stagecraft, like a, a building a, a, a stage for theater or for film is different than building a building, uh, building a true space that's gonna withstand uh, energy use, uh, all of it. I think we need to be clear about that distinction. So one thing would be a theatrical thing, a scenographic thing, I guess, no? what you're talking about. And uh, maybe that's a, the accident that, we can, that can happen no? with all this technology around us. Well, we, you know, um, I, I, sub I, uh, I submit that cyberspaces can be very interesting, although uh, I have another quote from Paul Virilio, um, where he says the um, the image compression, which allows information to be stored, has promoted the compression of history and finally the disappearance of the event. And by the event, one can interpret that means life, that means, it can, that means space, actually, as well. The space and life are, 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 are all intimately engaged. But there are cyberspace events happening in our world in, in very simple, mundane ways. Uh, for example, the natural gas ad, where these people are walking around talking about the environment, and, 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 and then they have these little words that are floating around them as they mention them. They, and somebody mentions the environment. Environment, you know, and then it's natural gas. And, yeah, it's a, that's a cyberspace thing. Um, they, and then there's also, uh, but, but it's a hypothetical cyberspace. It's not a, it's not hyperspace. Hyperspace could be where you're, you're um, you're in Detroit, and you knew that uh, there, there was a, uh, a great restaurant, uh, the last one in Detroit, probably. And it was <laughs> down the street. <coughs> you didn't know exactly where it was. But you knew your friend had been there, and they left a tag. So you pick up your iPhone, and you go like that, and you go, oh, it's at the end of the block, right? Because there's an iTag there, right, for that restaurant. That's, a, that's cyberspace. Now, I, um, I think that fundamentally, and this, I'm, with, I'm with Chris, fundamentally, I don't care how many words you put there and how complex our environment gets from a digital point of view, the ultimate frame of reference is physical. It's bodily. Yeah, but it's isn't, bodily, there, exactly. isn't there a phenomenological experience when you get into these spaces where you're interacting with technology, creating these scenarios? You mean it, uh, so the perception that you're going to get of, of the, everything that is around you because of all this technology wouldn't affect as well your senses? I, 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 all of the evidence is, yeah, it does. Sure, I mean, watching yeah. movies does that, but, yeah. but there's a, dis a distinction between making buildings and making movies. And I, for me, it's just, I like movies, I like filmmakers, I like talking to people that make films, I like all that's about it, but I... Uh, it can be counterproductive for, uh, especially within a school, uh, for us to, to confuse our, our practices. I mean, uh, and it's not to say that we, we, we don't learn a great deal from these other, other things. I mean, we, we may look at beekeeping 
and spend a lot of time making, raising bees and building things for bees to live in. And, and that's fantastic, but it's, that's beekeeping. And the, the key is, translate, for me, it's translation. It's not, a, um, f since the beginning of time, we've always had a wealth of resources and inspirations, and we've never had, I mean, just look at Baroque architecture. Uh, I mean, making crazy form has never been the problem. Uh, the issue is how do we translate these things that fascinate us into our discourse, into our language? Into into a, a, la a bodily language of architecture. For me, that's it's a very. And I'm, I'm being maybe overly didactic about it, but it's to me, it's 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 it comes down to, to being that clear. And I think that's what's at stake for schools. I, I mean, I, I actually think right now across the board, our, most schools in this country are. I mean, we have better schools and weaker schools, but I, I don't think um, enough schools are dealing with this head on in in, a, in as direct of a way as possible. And. I may be on the outside of this, and I can go away. That's fine. But I, I, mean, I, I mean, I see the hold of the discipline narrowing itself into extinction, and it, it doesn't seem wise. Do you think it's because it just it's just sexier to deal with abstract geometries in the place? Yeah, we, we're just easily distracted. Yeah, and yeah. and it's to do the hard work of 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 committing to translating beekeeping into architecture uh, involves a, a lot of unsexy, you know, heavy lifting, and and unless we commit to that. Um, we sell ourselves short ultimately. And I also turn it the other way around too. And from the, I, mean, I turn, I turn the, the idea of cyberspace around the other way, in the sense that we, if we're the keeper, if we're concerned about the three, the, about the body environment, which it's, you're hearing from me and and, 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 and from Hedrick on the social side, from Chris on the physical side, if we're concerned about that. Um, Certainly, we're having an impact. How many of you play Red Dead Redemption? Anybody play Red Dead Redemption? <laughs> wow. right. That's an amazing game. I'm very scared right now. It's an amazing As a model, that's a great 3D model. I, don't, I mean, it, it has, uh, it is much better than, um, I mean, I just, to give it an, an, uh, a, a kind of way. Uh, okay, Grand Theft Auto, anybody into Grand Theft Auto? <laughs> I, no, all right, I got one in the back. Okay, um, Red Dead Redemption is a much more fecund model than, uh, than Grand Theft Auto, which is pretty flat. Um, and and my, I guess my point there is they're learning, in that case, they're learning from us. I mean, I, I'm not sure that they have architects on staff. But my point is they're learning from the, the discipline of the body environment to make a better game to make a, um, a, a more uh, interesting and a more um, fecund ex um, gaming experience. They're, it's not the other way around. So, I, you know, and you could say, well, why should we pay attention to gamers? Well, because, because uh, Battlefield 3 is going to earn a billion dollars in two months. I mean, there isn't anything else on Earth that is actually that pro successful and profitable. But. And so my, my point is that, that I don't think we can dismiss living in the three in the. I don't, I, no matter how clever cyberspace gets, um, no matter how clever uh, the social, the e space gets in terms of, of social experience, it will n never replace um, the hu physical human interaction. And and it's our job. That's our role. Getting back to our role, the initial question. That is our role, is to define. The, the world physically in a way that um, supports human interaction. Yeah. And I will have a question for the audience. If by the year 2050, as predicted, most of the world population will live in cities, I think some of the questions that future generations will have to address. We have New York and we have LA. Both types of cities have proven inhumane. I've lived there long enough. I think they're inhumane, especially LA, <laughs> where you have to wake up at 4 in the morning to start working at 8 because the distance is so the spread of the metropolis. Now, what would be here in the American West? We can start from scratch. You can make a new city. What is it? Where is your imagination? How do you imagine new ways of living for the 21st century in which we are? I think these are some of the questions 
that I think are pertinent. So we do not repeat the mistakes of what has been done. We don't recreate Houston. We're basically the satellites all over. How can we come close, I think, and benefit from the beauty of the American Southwest that will get populated through very tricky kind of politics? Even though West Texas and Texas as general is very unpopulated, that there are a lot of forces that will you know, merge these people into cities. You know, these are the forces at work right now. How can we as architects and maybe urban planners, but you know, to me that's all the same thing, right? I mean, uh, how, can, how can we imagine if we don't put a vision there? In that sense, I want to be creating imaginary spaces because I think that's one of the very fundamental problems that we will face in the future. In, I have grown up in a city. I can go back to the same city. It has changed. The old cities have changed. So how do we recreate these type of beautiful city experiences? And I'm sorry, I'm talking about the, the bodily experience in that sense. And I believe in the benefit of artifacts and technology in making us see farther, move farther to the moon, but we're not living on the moon. It's pretty boring there. Anyway, we came back to planet Earth. I Skype in the morning, so I'm in Europe every morning, even though I'm physically here. Nevertheless, how do we create this? I'm, I'm an urban orphan. That's how we call ourselves. We call ourselves <laughs> urban orphans because we can't go back to the city as we really understood it. And so how do we recreate it? Well, it's one of my questions and my you know, things that I think about is maybe one of these, maybe the bodily, yes, because I want to experience uh, that, that feeling again and try to diagnose it, analyze it. Um, you know, what can that be? How can we recreate it? What seeds can we plant so that future generations can pick it up and it will grow into something like that? But you know something? I love the chaos of Los Angeles and I love the chaos and drama from New York, including kind of like all the crime and whatever it may happen on there. And I really love Lubbock is like living on the, on the moon. Hmm? So, so how can we mediate that? I mean, sometimes chaos is important as well in order to bring that context. I was very pragmatic about, you know, where can you live and how far do you have to travel to go to work? I was pretty, pretty pragmatic with that. And being a student, you're not very rich. You all know that, right? So uh, you're going to have to travel. Uh, I don't, and to have a life that's fulfilled. So I'm not saying these are bad cities. I'm saying they're very difficult to live. But when Margaret Crawford talks about moving through Los Angeles in the helmet of your automobile, that's a very powerful essay. And, and it certainly is kind of how Los Angeles works. But I compare that with Paris. Paris works. You can get from here to there. Los Angeles is a disaster. So you have to think of it like you're in the helmet of your automobile. And there are episodes. There's an episode at the beginning, someplace there's an episode midway, and then there's an episode when you get where you want to be. But as a continual urban environment, it doesn't exist. But, but, but it's a function of how you structure your life. I've met more and more people recently who live in Los Angeles without cars and ride bicycles and are completely happy and ecstatic there. What that means, of course, is, is where they live and where they work isn't 20 miles away. I mean, they, they're making decisions about how they structure their, structure their world. And, and to me, that's where it becomes exciting, is we can start to reimagine our, our use of a place like Los Angeles right here, right now, rather than waiting for the metro to, to show up or waiting for um, some other you know, magical vehicle. But even here in Lubbock, Texas, the city keeps on growing towards the southwest, further and further and further down. And so now there's the Marshall Sharp Freeway, so in 15 minutes you can be on 114 and live there. If you keep on growing in that direction, you know, we, 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 we are merely here repeating what has been done in Houston, what has been done in Los Angeles, where people move further and further and further away, and maybe you know become conscious and mindful about that, and that's I think where one of our roles are. I mean, partially um, because I see urban planning and design and development, you know, part of, of, of the role that we play um, and, and, and our responsibility, rather than leaving it over, you know, uh, to profit margins and other kind of things, you know.
Or, or, um, in the next, well, we have Urban Tech. Urban Tech is on the Luca campus downtown. We have a studio downtown. That studio, uh, uh, David Driscoll, who runs that studio, um, meets with the TIF board, every the CBD TIF board, that's a central business district, tax increment financing board. They're the people that figure out how to use the taxes that, and, and they plan for how to increase taxes within that district, which is most of downtown level. So uh, we have a role. This college has a role in the future of Lubbock. The Lubbock we see is not is, is not the Lubbock that we see today. I, I don't see that. I, I see another Lubbock. I see a Lubbock that, that is dense, um, a Lubbock that you can ride a bicycle to work in. Um, and I, and, and I, 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 I agree with you that it is about the choices we make. But of course, also getting back to what we were saying before, it's about, as architects and urban designers, structuring the relationship so that more and more people can make those choices. Exactly, yeah. When, when we were in Austin, um, at the Bicentennial, uh, my partner, uh, at that time uh, my teacher, um, uh, created a, a thing called uh, Austin Creeks. Was that he found out that they were going to fill in all the creeks. Austin is like a hand that goes out in both directions like this. This is the Colorado River. All of my fingers are the creeks. They were going to fill them all in. Why? Because that's where the, that, that's the easiest place for them to put the sewers. So they're going to fill in all the creeks and put sewers there. But my, my partner figured, I don't know how he did this actually politically, but he figured out that, that if, if you looked at every one of those creeks as a linear park, and then you said, how close could people be to that park and then to the downtown lake park, if you had a bike trail there, then he was able to say that I know a cheap way, this is, this is his argument, I know a cheap way to actually impact three quarters of the citizens in Austin. All you have to do is put a bike trail, a hike and bike trail on every one of those creeks. So that's exactly what they did. It became the bicentennial gift to Austin. And it's one of the many reasons why Austin's weird today. <laughs> but, but it gets back to the point of re recreating the city in such a way that you can live the kind of lifestyle that Chris is talking about. I want to bring up a historic example of uh, Olmsted, who developed Central Park in, uh, in New York, which was one of the first public parks. And he lobbied quite a bit in order to get that in the true because it's public money that was invested in public uh, in a public space and that was successful so I think there are good examples in this country you know of, of, of creating that I think what is you know what I working on some of these management with management students there was one person said as architects we not only have to creatively solve the problem you also have the duty to creatively restate the problem towards your clients whenever you get a problem and that you have to restate the problem, redefine it, and come up with other solutions. Um, so you have the right to do so. Um, yes, look at the Olmsted and then you see you know, how much he lobbied to get that true. And that's quite a bit of real estate property right there. I don't know how much it would be a square foot right now, uh, of investment to, to get that true. Obviously, it was historically and maybe today very difficult to achieve. Um, but that's why you can think how many square footage and how much money that represents when you look at it as square footage uh, on multi story buildings um, of this kind in, um, as a public park. So I think that was a good example. Uh, could you bring up Stephen Hole's linked hybrid project? Uh, Stephen Hole defines space by defining the edges of this uh, sort of city within a city in Beijing. And he creates an open space in the middle and along the edges he creates voids to that open space. Mm -hmm. And my kind of question is, as architects, do we think of the buildings that we create as I mean, they are objects. Do we create, think of those as an object space 
and the space we create around those as open space, and do we think of those as two separate spaces, and how do we successively, successive, uh, successfully, yeah, connect those spaces, or do we think of them all together as just one space? Well, they, uh, it's a, uh, it, you know, we all, um, um, we all look at the Denoli plan of Rome, right? The, the tax map of Rome from 1746 or something, something right. like that. Um, it's, uh, I, Clifton's my, my, my own historian, that's really great. Um, and, and uh, but to, to answer your question, it's, it's not an either or, they're connected. And it's important to understand that, um, that open space within a building can contribute to the, the, the tapestry of public space that is available and that, and, and that, that can support the, the, the celebration of, of social intercourse. So it's not an either or situation. Hopefully in the best design, what up? In the best design, they, they work together. Uh, and, and, and in the best design, they're, um, they're, they're um, big spaces and smaller spaces and medium-sized spaces. And, and they, 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 uh, they, uh, they reinforce um, different levels of, of social intercourse. It was Hildebrand who compared space in the 19th century with water. And anybody would you emerge in water um, could be an enclosed, confined space, so it's separate. The contemporary architect would be Ando, who, by definition, for his houses, selected you know, to make uh, a, a, an enclosed space on itself, where one enters, and it's a place of refuge, it's a new womb, and then one rediscovers that it's out of the public space. It's really kind of seclusion of, versus modernist architects who have this blurred boundary between public and private space. It can be blurred. I think we have to stop thinking of disjoint objects and maybe start looking in their overlap, their intersection, where emergent properties happen anyway. It's a matter of spatial relationships between one and the other. And rather than you know, kind of saying the mall is out there, which is southwest and on that corner, and you know, uh, the architectural building is here and I live here, you know, and it's discrete objects in space. When you start overlapping them and layering them, and in letting them interact, that you have, but it is by choice. I think you know, we culturally we can decide on what we do. You have a right to decide. I think what you do in all responsibility as your office architect to make a secluded space, a really confined, autonomous space, or one that is interacting with other spaces. The facade, which is the mask between the public space in France and the private space. What happened behind, you know, that was a big distinction, right? I mean, the facade was there because the facade was a wall of the public space. And that was prime, rather than decide elevations of these buildings were never even designed by architects. So it's a, the, it's about ultimately it's the fluid fabric of the city, and if I mean the problem with this with this image of the and of the project I haven't been there is is we're not we're not on where did it go? You moved a little. I want that. Bring that here. <laughs> Uh, is the, the, the fluid interaction of the city, right? There's a room, come on, man, here you go. There's, there's a person here. Um, there's a room, outdoor room, and an indoor room, and, and this, the, the brilliance of the Noli plan is that it's a vehicle that, that uh, deals with the city spatially, right? And, it's, just, and it, it does, it's not just outdoor, indoor, it's more sophisticated than that. Uh, it deals with, with these public domains of the city and, the, and allows us to see fluid connections within, right? We can actually understand what that is as a bisector of these two spaces, but these as a feeder coming in. I mean, to me, that's, that's a, a thing that as we move into the domain of the image and move into the, the domain of total, totalizing market-driven uh, developments, we, we, it gets harder and harder to draw 
uh, and to situate our work within a larger context, a larger spatial context, right? We, we may, and even when we do, we tend to do it as a series of stupid boxes, you know, the Woody Guthrie song, little boxes on the hillside <laughs> made of ticky tack. Um, and it's, uh, we're not dealing with a, the, a spatial fabric. And we can draw Lubbock as a series of boxes, or we can draw it as a contiguous sea of space that's punctuated by a bunch of, um, you know, pylons like a jetty into the ocean, uh, and and that requires a, a reprioritization of how of how we look, and that's something that architects can do and do really well. We just need to task ourselves with with that spatial understanding more directly. Let me give you this quote. I'm going to read it. We separate limits and bring into a human scale a part of unlimited space. This is Rietveld, um quote on space that. You know, it's for human body story, and we limit the infinite space. How we do it, you know, we can do it in different ways. But, uh, this goes back to the, you know, our fear of agoraphobia and claustrophobia. Uh, that is really what set Sita out, Camilo Sita out, and kind of, you know, we want tension and then relax, and but in front of infinite, in infinite extend of space, that is what we do, but it is on human scale, you know, and, you know, I, I think architects have to deal with the human body. For a long time I've been working and doing conferences with engineering that design planes, um, you know, all kinds of artifacts. In, it, it was very difficult to, to me at a point to stay in that domain because they never questioned but never addressed human needs. And the human was merely a measured object that you could set in a seat, first class or second class or third class in an airplane or something like that, but not uh, a human with all his physical, social, spiritual needs. And that is what we do as architects. We try to make people happy. I mean, architectural theorists have said that, both the public and the private, but that uh, what does it mean to make people happy is a big question also, right? Uh, it might be enough to give him some Halo or Assassin games, or, uh, the new Modern Warfare 3. Yeah, I know, I don't play this. <laughs> Where's the first person cooking games rather than shooting games is what I want to know. <laughs> Thank you, that's my problem. Uh, about, I forgot what the building is called, but uh, John Gould's trying to get a new skyscraper built. It kind of looks like a shard in New York right now. And a lot of architecture, I guess, uh, critics have been saying that it's probably going to be the best building they ever built, maybe the best one that ever in New York, so or in, in an urban landscape. So what makes that space so successful when it's purely, I guess, based off the te tectonics and the tectonics of the building effect of the space? I don't know the building. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's uh, John Novell. I forgot what it's John Novell. Uh, it's in short. Oh, the shark. Yeah, it's like a shark. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, that, that, uh, I, there's a, it's a trick question. Uh, <laughs> Because I think there's more. There's a couple of layers to it. One is about the morphology of the city, and the other is about what the building is, and the other is about whether this is going to be a good project for this character or not. Um, so I don't know. There's three of them. <laughs> this is the hyperspace. Get used to it. Not too much. I know my eyes are going. I'm getting old, but it's cool though that the people don't move. I know all the work by Jean Nouvel in Paris, and I have to admit that he is a real great. Um, he challenges the boundaries, uh, and I think these great star architects—that's what they're doing. They're challenging boundaries, and they actually can do it. Um, I'm always very careful by, you know, seeing something that's still um, as a project. If you have a chance to go and see the real built building, then you will observe the great innovations that they have. They are very subtle, 
but they are very profound. And I do know that he is a great architect, so uh, if he accepts a, you know, a, a project like that, if he wins the competition, you know, they, he might be sure that there is some relevance to what he does, but more than that, you know, from a building we don't know, I don't know, I wouldn't dare to say anything. Um, uh, you know, you know, I don't know. It's, uh, it is a trick question in a way. It's like uh, it's like the question of, and I'm not, I'm not criticizing you. But it's like the question of when did you stop beating your wife? You know? <laughs> um, so, uh, when we got divorced. It's true. What, what is a good building? <laughs> I still believe it's those. <laughs> We're back to Grand Theft Auto here. Um, and, you know, you know, the, the dimensions of a building, from a point of view of an, an architect, the dimensions of the building are gigantic. And by that, I mean there are many different dimensions of what makes a good building. Um, it can be tectonically good, it can be good spatially, it could be good urbanistically. Um, looking at I, you know, I, um, didn't Jean Nouvelle do the Cartier Center in Paris? Um, I, it's a gr I, I really like the building, and there's an interesting way in which it integrates its, uh, its context. Um, the, when they did the uh, Institut du Monde Arabe, the Arab Institute building, that building actually works pretty well urbanistically, but uh, Jean Nouvelle wasn't the only architect on that building. There were, there were like four different firms, architecture studio, who the architecture studio has a very strong process. Um, they call the red trace, or the tracé rouge, which is uh, which embodies um, uh, patterns in the environment into the plan of the building, into the urban environment, into the plan of the building. So it's one of the things they generally are fairly good at. So I, I don't know, I, and I I can't answer it for for this one because well, I, I, I don't know enough about it. The question would be like, for example, the waterfall image. Was that considered more of a distraction, or does that enhance it spatially? I think it's a distraction, but it's... It's the waterfall image. I'm not, I'm not sure. The, the waterfall over there. Uh-uh. Yeah. Uh -uh. But I, I, I think the question, I just want to interfere for a second, um, is that it's really, who cares about this uh, in the discussion? Because I think um, what you're asking is, how do you evaluate? Yeah. And that's a tough question. <laughs> Really complicated question, and we're sort of even, you know, we're sort of spinning our wheels here, and saying, well, you know, there's sort of space you can look at, there's tectonics. I mean, you got to go stand it. That's why I'm not an architectural critic. I have the courage to do that. <laughs> but, but I think you have to go stand in it, and you have to absorb it and, and take it in with your body, and then the conversation can start to have traction. But until that point, it's um, it's some chatter, maybe interesting chatter, but maybe not. I. Um, just in, but in the way of closing and shifting, it's a good question, but it's not a closing question. Um, so I just I, as a closing remark, uh, Andrika just mentioned boundaries and kind of pushing boundaries. And I, I, I have to say that I am damn impressed with this event and the turnout and the, and the energy in the room. I mean, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I mean, the fact that you all are here after two hours of babbling uh, and committed <laughs> Uh, committed to a conversation about something core to, to architecture and to your education is fantastic for the school. Uh, I, this is the first one that I've been able to attend since being on the road uh, earlier in the semester, but uh, it, it's things like these that, that make great schools, and it's, it's because uh, it, it's a conversation bigger than, you know, will this get me an A in this class? Is this the answer that so-and-so wants? Uh, it's, I'm committed to the conversation that's happening within the discipline, and I'm invested in, in sticking that in being part of that conversation in, in a larger way. And so, I mean, for me. Well, thank you so much for coming, and thank you, everyone. Um, it was a pleasure having you.